My friend, you are a god that forgot that you are a god. That is the story of your life right there. That is your psychological biography right there. <laughs> And not only yours, basically the whole humanity's biographical collective biography. Oh, uh, yeah. Biography, co collective biography. Not everyone, a lot of religions in the world still today, they worship the eternal merging between God and human. But here in the West, we split it in a dualism, what is to be divine and what is to be mundane. And if you are in the West, United States, Central America, the Caribbean, Spain, <laughs> you know, if you are in the West culture, probably you are divided in the inside and you think that God is out there somewhere, maybe in the clouds, maybe in heaven, maybe in the ocean, maybe as a alien in Mars, but he's out there, right? And you are here. You are just another type of thing. And that is a very common mistake that will become a barrier to, you, to your most potent spirituality. And of course, personal development. So I'm here today to remind you, hey, baby, you are a god. And it's not because you are special. We are all gods. Your neighbor, that weird guy that is always screaming. <laughs> him, he's a god too. <laughs> you know, your first grade teacher that she was like a very weird woman. Very hostile, maybe. She's a goddess too. <laughs> The mother of your boyfriend that you don't like. Well, bad news for you. She's a goddess too. Donald Trump. The politician that you most hate in your life. Can be Donald Trump, can be Mussolini, can be Hitler, can be whatever. He's a god too. <laughs> The Pope, Kanye West, Kim Kardashian. <laughs> Logan Paul they are gods too <laughs> hey this is just a funny way to exemplify what I'm trying to tell you it's not that you are a god because you are special or unique or singular in any way no we are all god this is the human slash god condition it's the nature's way it's a right is our gift and our course. <laughs> and today in this episode, baby, I will be reminding you this through a very powerful story, a very powerful myth that is called the Hanuman myth. Basically, it's a Hindu god that you will learn a lot about him today and he will be our medium to remind ourselves that we are gods that forgot that we are gods. transformative podcast in this god like multiverse this is the mastermind podcast challenge 
Do like a monkey. Ooh, ooh, ah, 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 ah. Season two with your host, your favorite doctor of all time, the Papacito of Puerto Rico. Dr. Derek, and this is the episode 604. Let me give you a disclaimer here, folks. It is not my intention to offend anyone in this episode. I don't want to offend Hindus or Buddhist people or other type of people that worship Hanuman as a god. Yes, I have a lot of humor in my art, but it's by no chance I am trying to offend people. What I will try to do uh, in this episode and the real value proposal that I am bringing to the table is I'm just trying to, hey, I'm not an expert on Hinduism. Yes, I went to India. I studied that there and I have been worshiping and meditating Hanuman for the last maybe six years of my life. But by any chance, I am an expert on this. I don't know every detail of the human Hanuman myth and religions. But what I can bring to the table is profound insights on how the Hanuman myth can relate to your psychology, to the collective psychomythology of the human existence, and how we Westerns and maybe also Easterns, how we can better activate this archetype in our lives in order to work better with this entity. Because as Hindus know, um, there's no only one entity, right? There's a lot of them. There's a diversity of gods. In the ultimate analysis, they are one, but they have different flavors, different energy patterns, different vibrations, like different notes on a musical spectrum. So what I'm going to try to do in this episode is basically um, to sing a new song about Hanuman, a new song that is very well mixed with other philosophies for us to have a better idea of what we can do with this entity or with this uh, deity, deity, okay? So yes, that was the disclaimer. How I discovered Hanuman. Well, this was one of my precious gifts of going to India. I always tell you, you need to go wherever you have fear to go because there you will find your treasure. As Joseph Campbell used to say, the fear that you have fear to enter, that you are afraid to enter, holds the treasure that you seek. So back in 2017, I was afraid to go to India, so I went. And there I discovered a lot of different things. And um, I have been telling stories about India in all the, not in all episodes, but sometimes, and also in some of my books that I will be launching, there's uh, pieces about my India trip. And also I will be doing a documentary. I have been working on that for years, but it's difficult to do a documentary. But someday that will be launched as well with exclusive footage that I recorded on India. But one of the gifts that I found there, man, was a book about Hanuman, specifically the Hanuman myth. And I think it was like a book for children or something because it was very, very simple. Like it gave you the story like very simple, very stupid, like not a lot of complexity. And I think that was one of the things that basically conquered my heart, the simplicity of it and how I can relate to it and how the whole collective uh, unconscious of the West can relate to that story. So I read that story and I realized that that Hanuman thing or that myth will be one of the most important discoveries of my life. And I have been uh, meditating on that since then. And I think that that myth that is very active on my psyche but it's very active as, for example, the Allah myth is very active from the Muslims. And also as the Christ myth is very active as well in my psychology. If you want more on that, just go to my episode called How to Develop Christ Consciousness. 
Um, and also other type of meats like the Buddha meat is also very active. So it's not by any chance that I am fixed with this myth. I love all meats, right? I basically am a meat, uh, how can I say, detective. Or I'm a myth explorer, right? And I acquire different myths and I install them in my software of mine. Like exactly as you go to different softwares in your laptop and you download them and then you can install them in order for your computer to, for, for your computer to run in a better way, in a different way, in a more advanced way or in a more specific way that you want your computer to run. Well, I see myths of religions exactly as softwares that you need to download. And I go and I download them. I install them in my spiritual life. I practice what that myth tell me to do. And basically, I am a hybrid of those myths. That's why I don't get married with any religion or any ideology. And that's why I can bring you here diversity of perspectives and that freshness and that scarcity of dogmatic thought that you can find in this podcast. But almost you cannot find this type of diversity and multiplicity of paradigms in anywhere else, right? Because most people are very dogmatic, very centralized, and they get stuck in one paradigm. I am more diverse And I am proud of that. So this is only one of my tools. Hanuman, the God, the entity, the myth, the archetype is only one of my tools. Christ is only one of my tools. Allah is only one of my tools. Because you are all of them. And if you get stuck in only one of them, you are partially realized. You are not totally realized, you see. You will be fragmentating Godhood. Give me just a second. Estoy grabando, bye. My wife is calling me. So if you just get stuck in one of these entities, you will be depriving yourself for basically the whole spectrum of godhood and you don't want that sorry my wife uh <laughs> she interrupted my 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 thought process i think that one of the missions of wife is doing that have you noticed maybe you if you're a man or a woman with wife Have you noticed how wives are like, you are very concentrated in something, you are rocking, you are in the flow, and then they do something like to distract you. And the whole purpose of that is to test your will. How strong, how focused, how concentrated can you stay? Look, look, she's calling me. She's calling me again. Estoy grabando. Estoy grabando, mi amor. Estoy en un podcast. Estoy en un podcast. Bye. So she's basically asking me that I need to open the door. I will not do it. And maybe you say, oh, Derek, that is so uh, unfair. Go and open the door. But see, if I go and open the door, it's like, what? Oh, man, I will open the door. Just give me one second. <laughs> All right, ladies and gentlemen, I basically failed the mission and I opened the door to my wife. So basically she won this war. But hey, if I don't open the door, she will slap my face after the podcast. And I don't want that. So anyways, let's go back to where we were. So yeah, you cannot get fixed with only one pattern of energy. Just imagine a song that is always in one note. 
how a horrendous song will be that? Do you want a, a, a song that it can have a good dance between notes, like ping, dun, 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 right? So that is basically how the spectrum of gods, how they are. They are different energy patterns that you can go there and knock at their door. Hey, can you please open to me? They open to you. They invite you to dinner. They have a good conversation with you. They give you some tips. And then in another context, in another circumstance in your life, you will say, maybe these tips that this God gave me, they are not working. Let me see if I can go to another house. And then you go and knock on another God and he gives you another tips. And then you go like that for the whole neighborhood of gods. And then you have kind of a good repertory of wisdom. You see. So I love the story of Hanuman. I discovered it in India and I have been practicing this that I will be teaching you science that. So what is the story or the myth of Hanuman? So look at this, man. Um, by no chance, this is the full spectrum of this story or this myth. I will just give you the details, the um, not the details, the nuggets. I will just give you kind of a trailer of the movie. If you want to go and read the full story, go and do it yourself. And here's the trick, because it's a very old story. No one knows what is the real story. So there's a lot of different versions of this story as a very old myth, right? So I will just give you the most important element as I can remember them. But if you really want the substance or the whole spectrum of the story, go and do your own research and go and study the myth of Hanuman by yourself. I strongly recommend that to you. And by the way, this is a very curious um, fact. Dragon Ball Z or Dragon Ball Super or Dragon Ball, I'm a huge fan of that series, of that anime, is inspired um, in, a, in a novel that is called, in an epic that is called The Journey to the West. I haven't read it. I will read it. I download it today. <laughs> so A Journey to the West is kind of an epic, I think from China, that basically is the story about a monkey that is a semi-god that basically fight demons and stuff like that, right? That monkey is Goku. And that novel, that epic of the journey to the West is inspired in Hanuman. So just notice a thing so mainstream today here in the West also, Dragon Ball is contaminated with Hanuman has the same pattern, the spiritual pattern of Hanuman. So if you're a fan of Dragon Ball, as I am, um, and I will do some someday uh, a very important episode about the similarities between Goku and Jesus. But anyways, you, when, you are, when, when you are watching Dragon Ball, it's, it's almost as, it is not almost, it is a spiritual revelation. And that can happen with a lot of movies, That can happen with a lot of animes, with TV shows. So you want more on that, go to my one of the most important episodes of this podcast that is called Movies Are the New Church. So when you are watching Dragon Ball, is sometimes you transcend some psychological stuff, some shadowy stuff that you have in your spirit. It's so powerful. Why? Why so powerful? Because Goku is a monkey. Goku is an alien monkey, a semi-god, and now he's turning into god mode, right? Because that is the story of Hanuman. It's a very old myth that is ingrained in our psyche. But not only is an old myth, it's your myth. It's your myth. You are the semi-god monkey that is a God that forgot to be a God. He's talking about you. That's why the projection, that's why the identification with the character, the dietic shift, as it is called in literature, dietic shift is when your mind 
change the perspective of the observer and you can observe the world through the character in a movie or in a fiction novel or whatever you are seeing in a theater play or something like that. You can do that in identification so easily in Dragon Ball because you are it. It's talking about you. And every movie is talking about you, but not every movie has that spiritual pattern so raw as Dragon Ball, right? Maybe if you see, I don't know, what movie? Maybe if you see Jaws, the movie about the shark, maybe that movie, it doesn't have so much of the spiritual pattern that you will be able to identify yourself in order to critically expand your consciousness. Now, Jaws, The first one, the original, is a cinema classic. I will watch it because it's on my list because I'm studying cinema very profoundly these days. But that doesn't mean they have a spiritual pattern directly for a very mythological, powerful myth as Dragon Ball. But anyways, the story about Hanuman is that this is a monkey that is a semi-god. Basically, he's a god, but also he's a monkey. Just like you, you're a god, but also a human and also a monkey, <laughs> right? And um, and this and this monkey is very cool, man. It's very it's very funny. One day he was so hungry that he wanted to eat the sun because the sun was so bright, and he went to the sun to eat it like a fruit. But then another god became very 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 furious and he threw a thunder on this monkey, and he got knocked out because he wanted to eat the sun. And he got his jaw injured. All right. This is a very important concept. And um, and I will explain what this means after that. But one of the powers of this semi-god, of this monkey, of this Hanuman, is that he has the power of fire, the power of water, the power of earth, and the power of um, air. So he dominates every element. That is what a god do. I have a Spanish miniseries, very, very popular That if you know Spanish, you can go and find it. It is called, you know, Agua, Tierra, Aire, eh, Fuego, Los Cinco Elementos, the five elements. And it's the five elements because when you can combine those four earthly elements, you create a new substance, the alchemical substance. When in alchemy, they call it the philosophical stone, a.k.a. the quintessence. And when you are vibrating through the quintessence, you are basically a divine being working on earth or walking on earth. So he was basically a monkey that was with quintessence on his consciousness. So that's why he has a lot of power. So after that, he he was a, a fool, like a, he was a buffoon. And, you know, if you know about archetypes, I have also, a, a, I don't remember it's in Spanish or in English. I have an episode about the archetype of the buffoon. But the buffoon is, and the fool, is basically the same archetype, different variations of the same energy. Also, the clown is this uh, variation. But that archetype is very important because it's kind of the precedent of your godhood. When you are the clown, the buffoon, the fool, when you don't know still, it's like you are almost about to transcend, but you still have some work to do. And you can see this in the tarots also. So he was a buffoon and he was tricking people. The trickster is another variation of this uh, archetype, right? And he was uh, manipulating people and stuff like that. So a sage, one day, he cursed this monkey because he was a bad monkey. He was tricking people, right? With all the powers that he has. So with, because he was very strong, he was doing uh, force like force show, uh, showing people his force, his strength, his might. He was flying, was doing stuff for money. I don't know. He was tricking people. He was fooling around. He was fooling around like a monkey of a circle, of a circus. And um, and this sage, this yogi, one day he cursed the monkey with uh, forget, uh, with complete. Uh, Forgetness. How do you say that? Um, yeah, basically he erased the memory of the monkey. So the monkey, Hanuman, the semi-god, forgot that he was a god. 
because it was cursed. And he only after that was only a monkey. No God. And not only he forgot, but he lost his powers. No more super strength, no more flying, no more big jumping, no more powerful stuff from his consciousness. But then something happened. He became a very humble person, very, very similar as, uh, you know, the story of Goku in Dragon Ball. He became very noble of, from heart, very compassionate and a devotee of God. And he became one of the guys of the army of one of the kings that also was a god, right? And remember, in these stories, everyone is a god. So it's just like, it's the story of all, if, if, if um, it's our story. So we are all gods. So everyone in this myth is a god. So one day, the queen or the goddess, whatever, the soul, she represents the soul, she represents the anima. I have an episode, I think this is in English, that is called Animus Anima Archetypes. So the anima is the soul, the moon, the affective component of your psyche. She was, of course, as in Mario, um, she was, um, how do you say, ah, oh, man, my English today, I'm forgetting a lot of words. He was trapped. It's not the word. Kidnapped. She was kidnapped by this demonic beast, a very powerful billion, just like Browser, right? Just like, um, I don't know, like the Joker of this story, like Frieza in Dragon Ball, like um, Thanos in Avengers. This billion, he kidnapped the girl and this god, this king, sent um, Hanuman and another arm, like Uh, Hanuman and the whole army to save her. But what happened? They could not save her because there was there were there were a lot of distance between the land where she was kidnapped and when they were standing. So I think that I, I don't know, I don't remember, maybe an ocean or something was separating the two lands and they could not cross this. But then one of them remembered that Hanuman, back in the day before he lost his memory by this curse, he could jump very, very big, very, very far, right? He could do this supra jumping like crazy. So he restored the Hanuman memory. And then Hanuman remembered that he was a god. And not only he remembered that he was a god, but he recover all the powers that comes with godhood because it's one thing to know that you are a god and it's another thing to act like a god it's a very different thing right remember to be a god you bear responsibility you have the whole responsibility of the cosmos in your hand aka the whole responsibility of your life of your decisions, of your creative acts in your hands. So then Hanuman jumped and he arrived to the island when she was kidnapped and he waited until the demons went to sleep and he spoke to her and he said, hey, I come to save you, you know, to, to bring you back to the king. And she told him, no, no, I want the king to save me. And that is another part of the story. Um, obviously, ah, man, that is a very archetypal as well. I will not get there, maybe in another episode. So, but then they um, capture Hanuman and they try to destroy Hanuman with fire. But of course, Hanuman cannot be destroyed with fire. Why? Because he dominated fire. A god cannot be destroyed with water. A god cannot be destroyed with fire. A god cannot be destroyed with air or earth because the god transcends all elements. His um, quintessence. Quintessence. He's, he's something that transcends. He's a vitalistic principle. He's here but not here. Right? You can kill Christ, the guy. But you cannot kill Christ, the spirit. You see? 
You can kill Buddhism, the dogma, but you cannot kill Buddhism, the spirit. You see? So they could not kill Hanuman and he went crazy and he burned all the all, all the village, all the buildings, and he came back to the king with the army and, and, the, and, and Hanuman say, hey, you need to come with us because the queen doesn't want to come if you are not there. So the queen went there again and they, they have this war, this spiritual war, very powerful war. And remember, if you listen to my episode that is titled You Are Going to War, one of the best episodes You know that the human psychological slash spiritual evolution is war. That is why war is basically the infrastructure of so many myths. Because war is the modus operandi, and that is another episode that you can listen, the modus operandi of human psycho-evolutionary development. War. Conflict. And another episode that you can listen is called the true nature of war, that is love. So war is always a reflection of love processes, unification processes that is going on in the psyche. The whole story of the psyche or consciousness is consciousness being one with itself. But to be one with itself, it needs to divide forever, forever, forever in more division, more conflict, conflict, war, 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 fighting, 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 combat, 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 diversity, diversity, multiplicity, multiplicity, dualism, 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 dualism. And that is the dynamic of life. That is how a flower can flower. Right? That is, that is how a language can be. Language is a component of multiplicity of words, of ideas, right? So the multiplicity is here because of the oneness. And that is war. So they woke and they basically saved. Oh, there's another part. Uh, a guy got injured, a god got injured in this war and they sent Hanuman to look for a herb to save this guy's soul, right? This body. And... um. So Hanuman went to a mountain to look for the herb, but Hanuman didn't know exactly what herb was needed to treat that wound. So he grabbed the whole mountain with him. And that's one of the most epic moments in the Hindu story. And um, so he picked up the whole mountain and now they could save him because he, they have all the options. So they save the princess or the queen or the queen or the goddess And then basically the God, the queen, the king offer Hanuman immortality, offer Hanuman everything, but Hanuman wants nothing. Hanuman is so humble that he only wants to be a devotee forever of God. Notice he's a God, but he wants to devote to God. That is a very weird stuff. That is a very paradoxical psychological trait, right? It's a... It shows a lack of narcissism. It shows a, a, a very abundant humility from Hanuman. So the God give Hanuman immortality, howsoever, and one of the other uh, characters say to Hanuman, you need to prove to ourselves that you are a devotee of this God. And Hanuman rip his chest open and if you look for um let me just share real quick my 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 screen so watch this the video form if you want to benefit from this if you go and you, you just look hanuman in google oh let me see what real quick look look this photo This is a very, very epical portrait. He stretched his chest. He ripped it off. And here in his heart, you cannot see it, but there is two gods there that represent the masculine and the feminine energy. Okay? This is a very, very important scene in this myth. Maybe this one. 
Oh man, it's difficult. But yeah, look at for you from uh, you know, do your homework. It's a very amazing um story. So yeah, basically that is the story. I know that there's more about it than he he keep uh helping his brother and stuff like that, but I think that for now for this podcast purposes that story is sufficient. So what lessons I can share with you of this story. What insights I have been developing in my own mind, in my own spirit from this story. Well, the first lesson is, hey, don't try to eat the sun. <laughs> When he was a, a kid, as I told you, he tried to eat the sun. But why you are not supposed to eat the sun? Well, because maybe you cannot handle what the sun will bring. And this is also the story of Horus, the Egyptian god. And um, I always forget the name of this other story about the son and the father, that they are flying very near to the sun and the son go very near up to the sun and he get his uh, wings on fire and he died and blah, blah, blah. So this is the same story, man. If you go and try to eat the sun, you will get hurt. That's why Hanuman got his jaw dislocated. What is the sun? Well, the sun is God. You cannot eat God. And what that means? Because maybe you are asking, but Derek, you are saying that I'm God. Why I cannot eat God? You know, it's, my, it's myself. Why I cannot eat God? Well, You cannot eat God because then your ego will become God. And that is a no-no, you know. That is hubris in Greek words. That is a very toxic narcissism right there. And you will lose your sight. You will think that you are God, <laughs> you see. And it's not that you are God. It's that you as a spirit are God, not you as an ego. But when you are trying to eat the sun, you are trying to tell the world, I am God. And that is the perfect example of the cult leader that say to his, to the members of the cult, I am the only God. He ate the sun. But when they ate the sun, that comes with danger. And sometimes it will not be a jaw that is dislocated. Sometimes will be madness. Sometimes will be Uh, paranoia, you see, the injury, the wound can be a psychological, probably will be a psychological wound. It can be uh, meaninglessness because if you are God, what is the meaning of life then? You know, you can, it can go very wrong. So to be a good God, dude, it's like you need to have the responsibility of a God, of a humble God. Yes, you are God and at the same time, you are just a worm. I have a video in my YouTube channel that is called You Are Both Gods and Worms. And that is an idea of Abraham Maslow, one of the most famous psychologists of all time. He said that because it's true. You are both at the same time. It's a paradox. You are a monkey. You are an animal. You are going to get, you know, you are going to the bathroom right after this podcast. Maybe you are listening this podcast while pooping in your toilet. You are a worm. You are just a monkey, man. You see, you are doing nasty stuff in the bathroom. But then you get out of the bathroom and you take a canvas and you paint a masterpiece. You paint a cosmos and now you are a god. But then you come back to the bathroom and you pee. You're a monkey. So you're a monkey and a god, a monkey and a god, a monkey and a god. Every time, every blink of your eyes is an interchange between monkey and godhood. Every inhalation and exhalation is an interchange between being a monkey and a god. So if you cannot sustain both ideas at the same time, you're going to be a bad god because either you will so, uh, over-identify with being a monkey, a.k.a. just a normal, average, stupid, animal, human being, or you are going to over-identify with being a god, a.k.a. a cult leader, narcissistic, possibly psychopathic beast 
that will create a lot of harm in society because you will be with these hubris that I am God. So it's, yes, you are God and you're a worm. Don't eat the sun. Don't eat the sun. Become the sun. And admire the sun. And devote the sun. That is something that Hanuman, after he went through his hero's journey, and he learned about his lesson, he went and became a devotee of God, although he was a God. So another lesson is, it's not about learning. It's about remembering. So you think that knowing God, discovering God, discovering your mighty power, you think that is something that you need to learn. You think that if you read the Bible, if you read the Quran, if you live, uh, if you read the Vedas, if you read, um, I don't know, whatever sculpture, whatever holy book that you can read, the Book of Secrets of Ocho, whatever book, the Red Book of Carl Jung, those spoke Zaratustra, Friedrich Nietzsche. Do you think if you read a holy book, do you think that you will learn? And yes, you will learn but you will learn information. The real thing that you need to learn is not uh, learnable. You cannot learn it. You need to remember it. You need to go back to the beginnings, even when you was not born as a human physical thing. You need to go back to the fabric of reality itself. You need to go back to the nucleus of consciousness to the origins of love, to the sound that was before of the Big Bang. <laughs> to the joke that was before the laughing in the multiverse. To the first movement that was no movement at all. You need to go back to the first type of light. You need to remember who you are. Not as a human, but as a principle, as a virtue, as a pattern in existence. And how you remember that? Well, with information, it will not be sufficient. Yes, this is a guide. This is like a GPS. But your GPS is not the road. Your GPS, your GPS is a representation of the road, right? When you arrive to the building and you see in your phone the building, that building in the phone is not the real building. It's a representation of the building. But if you look through the crystal of your car, through the glass, you will see, oh, look, the building is there. And even that is a representation because it's what your eyes and your occipital love is, representa is representing from the world. So you need to get out of your car and you need to enter to the real building. And even that is a representation. So you need to go back the representations, go back, go back, go back the chain of divinity of creation to go back into until you arrive into the first stage, into the first node of that infinite network of creation, that first node is God. And that God is indistinguishable of you. You will be lost. You as a human will be lost in that chain, you see. But something will continue on that chain. What will continue? Your consciousness. Your consciousness will continue in that, that change. Even your human form, your morphology, your social construct, even that, when that disappeared, your consciousness can go back, come back, come back, go back, go back in meditation, in meditation, in meditation. You're basically penetrating all the karmas, all the lives, all the forms in this world of form. 
And then you go, you come back until that first principle and then you are there and you are that. And you are nothing because there is nothing there. Very profound. So it's not about learning, it's about remembering who you are. In meditation, in yoga, in pranayama, in breathing exercises, you remember who you are. But you need to have this intention very clearly in your mind, in your spirit, in your everyday karma, in your everyday karma yoga, in your everyday actions, in your tantric sophistication of consciousness. In every breath, you need to remember who you are. This is contemplation, my friends. When you contemplate the self, the self disappeared. That is very advanced. I, I will not explain that today. But yeah, that is very advanced. Anyways, you become a god by being a devotee of God. Remember Hanuman, he ripped his chest And he has all the gods there, the feminine and the masculine, the yin and the yang, the animus and the anima. He was a god, but he still has respect to the gods. So you may ask, Derek, okay, I'm a god. So that means that I cannot worship Jesus? Why not, dude? You are a god. Jesus is a god. Why not? Are you better than him? No. Are you walking as pure, as holy as him? Probably not. Well, of course you can worship him. Of course you can learn from him. Of course that you can follow his example. Because you are a God that is worshiping a God. In an equal relationship. Not, not as an inferior that is, you know, worshiping something that is in the abstract ether. No. A God Worshipping an equal God, that is the divine marriage between sun and moon, between yin and yang, between the tiger and the red dragon. And that creates, by the way, the spiritual embryo. <laughs> and that is very advanced. I will, whew, maybe, maybe at one day I will do an episode about it, but that is very advanced. Just do your research. What is a spiritual embryo from Taoism? That is inner alchemy. And basically that is a magical technology that you can create when you collapse all the opposites in your spirit, in your divine work. In alchemy, it is called the great work. I have a Spanish episode about it. It is called Introducción a la Alquimia, if you know Spanish. But yeah. You need to devote gods and they need to be in your heart. So that means that he feel the God. He didn't, you know, the God were not in his head, in the intellectual realm. Who cares about it? If you see one of the best movies that I have been watching lately, studying cinema, it is called The Yellow Submarine. It's a movie about the Beatles. It's an amazing movie. Watch it. Watch it today. And in that movie, something that happened is that they discovered this creature that was very scientifically minded, right? And he was all logos, all intellect. But at the end of the movie, I don't want to spoil you, but at the end of the movie, he transcends by becoming poetic, by becoming, by, by becoming a poet. So the scientific became a poet. The scientist became a mystic. That is the transcendence. So it's, Hanuman doesn't have the gods in his head. He have them in his heart because he filled them. He loved them. He nurtured them in compassion, not in ideas, not in dogma, not in beliefs, not in learning, not in the scientific principle of God, you know, the atom of God, the big blah, 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 blah. Not in that. In surrendering to God in your feelings, in your love, in your complete affect dimension. And that is very essential for you to become the archetype of the witch. That I will do an episode very soon about this archetype. The archetype of the witch is the archetype of using your emotion as a 
magical device. The emotions are magic substance. Stay tuned for more, baby. This is getting better and better and better. I told you, boy. I told you that this is the most transformative podcast in the multiverse. I told you. Huh. I told you, baby. Also, I learned in this Hanuman story that you cannot be afraid of to be a ferocious warrior in order to save your soul. When it's about your soul, man, you need to become a ferocious warrior. You need to burn buildings down. Remember, the queen symbolizes the soul, the anima, the emotions. And sometimes when you become a god, you forget about it. You forget about the emotions because you become a, a very sales like God, a very masculine type of God. But the whole journey of the Christian God was to understand that he needs to balance his energy. That's why he created Christ, because Christ is the good combination between anima and animus. And then he, the God learned from him that. There's the, the whole story of the Bible. For more on that, I told you, go to Christ Consciousness, the episode. So you need to save your soul. You cannot lose that. That is very important. Also, be very, very mindful. Your soul can become neurotic and your soul can become unstable. Of course. That is the emotions. So you also need to balance very good your soul with your masculine energy with your centeredness, with your groundness, with your sobriety, being sober, being stoic. So it's a, but not so stoic that you cannot even create a poetry. Not so stoic that you cannot even lose yourself in the lover archetype sometimes. You know. Not so stoic that you cannot even write a song. A beautiful song. For more on that, watch the episode titled, uh, titled Life is a Song. So it's a good combination between your soul and your character, your mind and your heart. And you need to be a warrior in order to maintain that. So fight for it, man. Fight for your soul. Fight for your heart. Fight for what you believe in. Fight for what you feel is right. Fight for your integrity. Fight for your life purpose. Fight for truth. And the last point that I want to illustrate in this episode is that you need to use the might of your faith to move or in this case to carry mountains you know Christ said that you can move mountains with your faith well Hanuman he didn't say that he basically carry a mountain in his shoulders with his faith and also he became a mountain because he's a shape shifter. That is another thing that I will not discuss today, but he has the ability to shift his shape, shift his forms. In Christianity, that is called becoming a new creature. And, it, and I will do an episode about this very soon. Becoming new. I have an episode that is very important on this that is called the law of the new. Becoming new again, becoming novedus, becoming novel. So what is the mountains of your life? If you don't know how to navigate the mountains, the obstacles of your life, well, dude, carry the whole mountain on your shoulders as Hanuman did. Carry the whole thing. Your back can sustain that. Your soul can sustain that. Your character can sustain that. If you have divine faith, 
all of the powers that Hanuman developed after he lost his memory were possible because he didn't only remember them, but he has faith in them. One thing is to remember a thing, and another very different is to have faith in what you remember. So whatever you want to accomplish in your life, whatever you want to extend in your consciousness, whatever you want to develop in your mind, men, deposit their full faith. Full determination. And I have an episode on English that is called Faith from my mini series of Think About uh, of Think and Grow Rich, the book of Napoleon Hill. Listen to that episode. Cultivate your faith on meditation. Know that nothing is impossible for a God. Know that basically the whole hero's journey of being a God is remembering that you are a God, not getting lost in your Godhood and using your God powers to create a better cosmos because that is what a God do. If you don't do that and you destroy the cosmos, you are not a God, you are a devil. You are, a, you are an ego. And for more on that, search my episode titled The Demons of the Ego. So move your mountains, my friend. Become the mountain. So that's it. Remember, you have an assignment. Go and read for yourself. You know, you don't know what many insights or the qualitative nature of these insights that you will obtain if you go and read for yourself. If you activate this myth in your own mind, go Google Hanuman story, Hanuman myth, and go and read it and see what this myth can do for your life. This was your favorite Dr. Derek Israel. Remember that you can donate on Patreon. And with that donations, you help this podcast stay free. Thank you for everyone that is donating. Um, you can donate only $5 per month. And the link is in the description. Also, I have a free Telegram group that you can join. Link is in the description. Um, also, you can visit DerekIsrael.com. There you can find all my courses. I have a course about integrity. Uh, a self-love course, a meditation course. Uh, I have a course on, um, what else? On hyper-productivity. I am about to launch the infinite creativity one. Um, I have the course of sexual mastery. So go and check my courses, enroll in one, and see how much you can evolve there. Trust me, that will be one of the best decisions of your life to go with a course with me. Um, also there, you can hire me as your guru. If you have spiritual concerns that you want help as your personal coach, you want coaching or as your psychologist, if you want psychotherapy and if you live in Puerto Rico. Um, also there, you will be able to find the books that I will be launching and all the merchandise as well that I will be launching very, very soon. For me, it's an honor to be here and I see you tomorrow in the next awesome